Bonjour, on dit que Queen est notre Queen de Shnakas, mais qu'on a qui Queen de Shnakas, mais qu'on a notre Queen. This is the place that I'm from, and I'm very happy to welcome all of you here today, um, and especially those who have traveled um, for your safe travels to have come here, and also asking for safe travels as you journey back to the places that you're from. Um, what a great opportunity for us to meet today and talk about these very important Supreme Court of Canada decisions and what underlies them from the perspective of law, but also from our Aboriginal perspectives. And that's really what we want to try and explore today. And you'll see that through the program we have um, legal counsel, we have community members, we have Indigenous academics. We've kind of I tried to bring together um, all of the parts of a, a dialogue that we're going to have take place over the next day and a half. And um, the, as Jamie said, the discussion arose uh, this summer, and I want to acknowledge Karen Busby of the Centre for Human Rights Research for being part of those discussions, and the University of Manitoba for agreeing to, to host this conference here and to make it as accessible as possible. Um, we're just so pleased to uh, to be able to take this uh, this on and, and to start and to continue this discussion. Now, referring specifically to uh, Chilcotin and Kiwaden decisions, um, whenever there's a Supreme Court of Canada decision, I get a phone call, and I get actually multiple phone calls from media, from friends, from colleagues. What do you think? And on Chilcotin, I had some pretty concrete ideas and, and actually uh, shared them with media. And when Kiwaden came out, I said, I just don't know, I don't understand. And people said, are you not a lawyer? How can you not understand? It's shorter than the Chilcotin decision. And all I could say was, I don't understand. So, you know, we've had the opportunity over a few months to refine our thinking and really th try and assess how these two decisions in interaction together can have bearing on where we are. Uh, today and what we need to do to understand them, implement them, contest them, uh, clarify them, and possibly improve the, uh, the state of Aboriginal law in Canada. So those are, are really the foundations of, of why we're here today. And I also want to acknowledge um, Elder Harry Bone for the, uh, the opening prayer and starting us off in a good way and also Linus Woods, who created the, uh, the art for the conference. I've done a lot of work with Linus, and he's a brilliant artist. And um, he, uh, when I talked to him about the conference, he agreed to donate this art. And um, I said to him, wow, the, the chief on, on horseback. And he said, yes, and you know what, Amy? That's a woman. That's a woman chief. And I thought, Thank you, Linus. I'm, I'm even happier to promote this as, as the image of our conference and, and remembering that balance and all of the roles that we have to play. So on that note, um, I would like to, uh, to start us off with our, our first panel and introduce to you Robert Jaynes, who's here from Victoria. Um, we tried to do the best with our weather, Robert. Thank you. We're sorry. It's, it's as good as we could get. Um, Robert Jaynes is a principal of uh, JFK Law that's based, in, as I said, in Victoria, BC. And his practice focuses on providing legal services, primarily in the area of litigation, which he's very good at, and related settlement negotiations to Aboriginal people across Canada. Uh, Jaynes is a member of the bars of Ontario and British Columbia and has appeared at all levels of court in BC, Ontario, Alberta, the federal courts, and many times in the Supreme Court of Canada, including on both of the uh, matters that we're speaking about today. And with that, I welcome Robert. Thank you. Oh, good morning, everybody. I'm Robert Jaynes. I'd first like to start off by uh, acknowledging the Treaty 1 people on whose territory we are. I'd also like to thank a few people. Um, one of whom I see here today is Bill Fobister, but more generally, I'd like to thank uh, J.B. Fobister, uh, Willie Kiewaten, the late Willie Kiewaten, Andrew Kiewaten, and the people of Grassy Narrows who gave me a chance to do the Grassy Narrows litigation, which was a piece of litigation I worked on for close to 15 years. Um, it was one of the most interesting experiences of my life, and um, one which I'm still uh, processing and thinking about. Um, the focus of my 
talk today is actually going to be on Grassy Narrows as we are in treaty country. Um, and it is the case that's most explicitly about uh, treaty. I will ultimately, as I get further along in my discussion, though, say that there's a link, a very important link between Chilcotin and Grassy Narrows. And I think what we see in these two cases, at least this is what I believe is going on, um, who knows, uh, the Supreme Court of Canada is not always uh, completely forthright about what they're up to, is we see here a major policy decision being made by the Supreme Court of Canada about how they want to approach the whole issue of the relationship between Aboriginal people and the settlers in Canada and through what constitutional mechanisms they see sorting out some of these deep, long issues. And um, in, in some ways, this has been a, a good outcome. In some ways, that has been a negative outcome. But, um, but what I primarily want to do today is give you a bit my thoughts on sort of, first of all, what the Grassy Narrows case was about, tell you a bit about the case, uh, tell you how it turned out at the Supreme Court of Canada, and I think uh, probably more importantly, talk a bit about where I see, at least from a lawyer's perspective, and I am a lawyer, um, you know, a lawyer from Newfoundland originally. Um, obviously, I'm deeply informed by that perspective. I'm not an Aboriginal person, and what I know about that can really only be come from what I've learned over the years from people, but I don't, I'm not rooted in that in the same way that many of the people in this room are. So this, this perspective will be a lawyer's perspective on what's happened and a lawyer's thoughts on, what, on what are, what's happened and, and where the future lies. And um, um, it's only part of the perspective. So with that, I'll, I'll start my comments. So what was the Grassy Narrows case about? And I think to, to, to ask that question, you have to start with what does the Supreme Court of Canada and what does our law seem to think that treaties are about? And the Supreme Court of Canada looks to the treaty-making process and to treaties as the ultimate means, their mind in many ways, I think the, the greatest means of reconciling Aboriginal peoples and non-Aboriginal peoples and their joint presence on First Nations land. And that, that of course, is the great mystery of Canada for, for people who think about it, which is that you have all this land that had plenty of people on it who had plenty of things to say about their land, who used their land, who occupied their land, who had a relationship with their land. And now you have a whole bunch of other people there. And it's not entirely clear how that happened. And in the case of lands that are subject to treaty, the Supreme Court of Canada has this notion, and I think it is a notion, that the treaties are the explanation. And that in British Columbia and places where lands have not been quote unquote ceded, that treaty is the solution there, that it is a coming together of peoples to uh, make a decision about uh, what, what it is their shared interest in the lands and, and the resources will be. But, but the truth is, and anybody who spent any time actually thinking about the historic treaties rather than just saying, well, I know what that's all about, um, and particularly the numbered treaties, know that in fact these documents as they've been implemented on the ground have done very little to actually reconcile Aboriginal people and the, or the First Nations and the colonial society that has come along. Uh, one has to be deaf not to recognize that there are dramatically different understandings of what the, treaty are, the treaties were about. Now on one side, and I'll say that's probably on the side of the white Newfoundlander crowd, if you grow up in non-Aboriginal Canada, you learn a story about the treaties that sounds somewhat like this. Treaties were fundamentally instruments of surrender. They established a relationship between the Crown and First Nations, largely founded on submission, acceptance, and cession. They represented the acceptance of an inevitable reality, that settlement was coming, that the lands would be opened up, um, that the resources would be taken, and that the Aboriginal era would come to an end. And what the treaties are really about is the acceptance of that, with the Aboriginal people securing some paltry protections in the forms of annuities and reserves and rights that can be eroded, but that fundamentally it marked the passing of an era of the past and into a great modern era of the, the, the we wouldn't use the word colonial, but the truth is the colonial experience. 
Um, and I gotta say is, again, growing up in Newfoundland, going to Catholic schools, largely being unexposed to Aboriginal people, I, is, is that that's the story I grew up with. Um, now, probably the first time I met an Aboriginal person who was a member of one of the treaty communities, I heard a very different story. And I've consistently heard this different story in every single community that I have gone into in the uh, 20 odd years that I've been practicing Aboriginal law and the, the 20, almost 25 years that I've been practicing law generally. And this story is a very different story. So if you speak to First Nations people, or at least when I've spoken to First Nations, or read, read the work, the words of Aboriginal people from the period just following the signing of the treaties, Here's a story that you hear. The treaties were not instruments of surrender or cession between sovereigns and subjects. Instead, they were more in the nature of international treaties. There was an agreement to establish high level and frankly sacred relationships between nations symbolically joined under the crown where there would be a sharing of land and resources. There'd be a peaceful relationship. The First Nations expressly did not give up their way of life, lands or resources, but did agree to live together in peace with, uh, and share the materials to the extent that there was surplus to share. There was a recognition that things would have to be worked out as time changed, as was often the case in the past, and, and, but that for now the treaties established a modus vivendi on a land, and again, particularly look at the numbered treaties and the robinson uran treaties in this regard, which was largely not expected to be heavily settled, heavily developed by either party. Um, those two stories are hard to see having anything to do with each other. But the truth is, those are the two understandings of the treaty that are out there, and they do not particularly reflect any form of reconciliation between colonial society and the First Nations. Now unfortunately, and now I'll speak for the law culture, the law's views of treaties, largely coming out of the St. Catherine's Milling decision and the related cases in the early 19th and 20th centuries, was developed without the benefit of the First Nations perspective on what treaties were about. Instead, that case law largely reflects um, the first story. It largely reflects a tale of seed, release, surrender. It largely reflects a tale of treaties being large-scale land transactions in which the crown and the governments acquired land that they could then develop as they wish in exchange for the modest uh, benefits in the treaties, the apparently modest benefits in the treaties. And it was not really until the late 20th century and I would say really the early 21st century, that the courts even began to figure out how to incorporate, or even frankly to become aware of the Aboriginal perspective on these treaties. So to my mind, the task takes facing First Nations, their leaders, uh, academics, I'm looking at you Kent here, um, lawyers, judges, and ordinary Canadians is how, in fact, to rewrite this legal story to truly have the treaties represent something more like the common intention that may have existed um, in the past at the time that the treaties were negotiated. And the truth is, and this was the part that, that really shook me in many ways, is that the story does have to be rewritten. Um, Alexander Morris, okay, so I'll just step back for a moment. Uh, I mean, the traditional non-Aboriginal explanation for this gap is a simple one, right? Is that the poor Aboriginal people weren't listening to what the, the, the treaty people said. There was a language gap, there was a sophistication gap, and that somehow it just was missed, the seed release and surrender business. That, that it was all just a slip up, and, and that, that, that if only when we look at the true historical facts, it was clear that everyone knew what was going on. And in fact, uh, Alexander von Gurnett, who testified at the, um, at the, uh, the Grassy Narrows trial, has testified in a number of other treaty cases, was quite explicit about that. He says, look, everyone knew what was going on. 
to the extent that people said things that were different, well, you know, they didn't really mean it, they didn't really believe it, uh, you know, it, it's just, so don't worry too much about what was said. Um, but, but in truth, when you look at the evidence, it's kind of shocking, actually, even from a non-Aboriginal perspective. So Alexander Morris, who is the architect from the non-Aboriginal side of the Numbered Treaties, was a careful record keeper. Um, from a very young age, he had a view to history, and he had a rather grand view of his own position in history. And as with many people in that position, he kept careful piles of notes about what he did, uh, actually from, from his youth. Um, but in particular, he kept careful collections of documents from the negotiation of the number of treaties, which he correctly perceived as an important historical process. And in the late 1800s, he collected these into a book, um, which is roughly called uh, The Treaties of Canada with the Indians of Manitoba and the Northwest Territories. And, and that book is not a coherent narrative. Instead, what it is, it's, it's literally a collection of letters, of notes, of transcripts of meetings, of reports back to the Governor General and Council, but it, it provides actually an amazingly comprehensive recounting of the treaty negotiations. And so I picked up that book, getting ready for the Grassy Narrows case, and read through it. Let's see what Morris had to say about this. Let's see what he actually says was said about this seed release and surrender business, and what he said about hunting rights and things like that. And what's fascinating, it's absolutely fascinating, is you can read every transcript of the treaty negotiations through treaties, um, through the robinson Huron treaties, through Treaty 1, 2, 3 through 7, which is what's in the book, and you will not find once in any of the treaty um, conferences the words seed, release, surrender, or sell, or give up your land ever mentioned. That is actually an uncontroversial statement. Even Alexander von Gurnett agrees that at no point in the treaty negotiations, in the spoken part of the negotiations, was any First Nation involved in the numbered treaty negotiations or in the robinson Huron treaty negotiations asked to surrender or give up their land. I've got to say, I was surprised. Basically, all the government relies upon is the document the treaty, the formal treaty document written in English, which they say, well, it was read out. The experts say, we're not sure it was read out in English or in Ojibwe or Cree, but it was read out. And surely they would have understood this seed release surrender business when that was read out. Considering that I'm not entirely sure lawyers understand the seed release surrender business when it was read out, uh, I'm not clear about that. But in fact, it's not just an absence of evidence that's striking about this. Um, Morris's book contains, and, and there's, there's two incidents that I would point to, but, but contains clear evidence that actually there was something positive put the other way. The first is a bit crass, um, and it involves the negotiation of the robinson Huron robinson superior treaties. In the case of those treaties, the, the um, negotiators for the government arrived up and they found, and it gets described in different ways uh, in, by different reports, but they found that some white man had been tampering with the Indians. That's the kind of phrase that's used. And basically what this white man had done is he told the Aboriginal people at the Sioux, um, here's what people got in treaties down south for their land. This is how much money per acre they got. Why aren't you getting the same? And when that was put to Robinson, Robinson said, but you aren't giving up your land. You are keeping your land. Um, we won't be using anything. In fact, you will be better off because you will still have all your hunting and fishing and all your other activities, and now you'll have a place to sell your game. So unlike the people down south who gave up their land and had farmers move on to it, you're not giving anything up. And that's why we're not going to pay you as much. Now, we do have a little document that we're not going to tell you about that's going to say seed, release, and surrender. Uh, but I, I got to say is that when I look at, looked at that passage for the first time, I thought to myself, if this had been a deal between me and 
uh, some person on the street, I'd be charged with fraud if I afterwards said that this was a deal that amounted to seed, release, and surrender. But Morris is a little bit more poetic about this. And there's a, there's a particular point in the negotiation of Treaty 6 where, you know, Treaty 6, there was a division amongst the Aboriginal leaders. Some were keen to take treaty, some were quite opposed to treaty. And Morris and Mackay, who were there, were, were desperately trying to persuade the leaders of Treaty 6, um, of, of what became Treaty 6, that they need not worry. And Morris um, gave a relatively poetic description of what he said the numbered treaties to that point in time had been about. And here's what he said, and this is, I promise you this is the only thing I'll inflict with you where I actually read something out of the quote. And he said this, he said, this is the seventh time in the last five years that her Indian children have been called together for this purpose, making treaty. This is the fourth time that I have met my Indian brothers, and standing here on this bright day with the sun above us, I cast my eyes to the east, down to the Great Lakes, and see a broad road leading from there to the Red River. I see it stretching to Ellis. I see it branching there, one to the Capel and Cypress Hills, the other to Pelly, to Carlton. It is a wide and plain trail. Anyone can see it, and on that road, taking for the Queen the hand of the Governor and Commissioners, I see all the Indians. I see the Queen's counselors taking the Indian by the hand and saying, we are brothers. We lift you up, we teach you, if you will learn the cunning of the white man. All along that road, I see Indians gathering. I see gardens growing and houses building. I see them receiving money from the Queen's commissioners to purchase clothing for their children. At the same time, I see them enjoying their hunting and fishing as before. I see them remaining their old, retaining their old mode of living with the Queen's gift in addition. Now, when I hear that, when I hear Governor Morris describing Treaty 6, Treaty 3, Treaty 1, Treaty 2, Treaty 4, Treaty 5 in that way, because that's, that's what he's describing there. When he's talking about the Great Road, that's Dawson's Road, at the Great Lakes is Treaty 3, Cypress Hills, Ellis, uh, Fort Carlton, Pelly. These are all places where the treaties were negotiated. That description of the treaties sounds an awful lot to me like the First Nations descriptions of the treaties that I hear when I go into the communities. It doesn't sound a lot like seed, release, and surrender. So, um, so what I hear, and, and I, you know, approaching it with a usual lawyer skepticism, are communities rel always saying to me, we did not give up our lands and resources. We made our treaty with the crown and expect the queen to ensure that it was respected. So that's by way of context about the treaties and about the sort of the, the, the conflict that exists between uh, colonial society or settler society, if you wish, and the, and the First Nations perspective on treaties. Now, the problem that was posed to me, and I, I met uh, J.B. Fobister uh, and Andy Kiewaten and then the late Willie Kiewaten, first, and actually I met them here in Winnipeg down at the um, Louis Riel Hotel at a conference, was, uh, was actually a simpler question, um, which was they were faced with large-scale clear-cut logging in their territory. Andy Kiewaten was told um, that Abitibi Bowwater had plans to log about half his trap line in the next year. Willie Kuwaitin had had a bit over half of his trap line logged in the previous about three or four years. J.B. Fobister was facing plans, had seen plans that saw anywhere from a third to two thirds of his trap line to be cut over. He said, how can it be that Ontario can, take, can let Abitibi take everything that was promised to us in our treaty by Canada? And you know, going forward is, is what I heard you know, very quickly and very often was that, look, how, how, I thought it was Canada that was supposed to protect us. I thought it was Canada that was supposed to be dealing with our treaties. Uh, I think some people took it further and said, I thought it was the British Queen and the British government that was supposed to deal with it. But, but uniformly, there was a call that we expected Canada would protect our treaties. 
and, and, and how is it this can be taken away? And, you know, and I heard the poignant story at Grassy Downs, and it is a poignant story. I mean, it, it famously lost its fisheries due to mercury poisoning related to the uh, development of the forestry industry in the 70s and 80s, where many of its children were poisoned. It, like many other Aboriginal communities, had lost generations of their children to the residential schools. The loss of the fishery meant the loss of their primary, uh, one of their primary food sources, and also one of the primary bases of their cash economy. Um, the industrialization of forestry had meant that many of the jobs that they had had in the forestry industry were gone, um, and that what they saw was now a forestry industry that was more systematically removing the trees from their territory while leaving them with no benefits. Uh, historically, in Treaty 3 country, flooding had taken away much of the wild rice that had been one of the other major staples of the, um, of the, um, the, the traditional economy. And, and fundamentally, what JB, Andy, and Willie were asking is, like, how is it that despite this great treaty that we have, that the government of Canada came along and signed, that we can have our way of life taken away from us? So what can be done about it? Now, before I talk about the case, I do want to talk about the larger picture and sort of the good news part of this story. Um, I don't know quite what's happened more recently, but from 2005 to 2015, Grassy Narrows has, in fact, been largely successful in keeping industrial logging out of their territory. Um, and that has been through a combination of efforts, both leadership efforts and grassroots efforts. There's been a blockade maintained on a road for close to 20 years now. There was a very intensive boycott and public campaign uh, against Abitibi that was coordinated with the Christian Peacemakers organization. Um, the First Nation was very uh, pointed about taking advantage of the environmental assessment process. Uh, there was the Kiwetan legal action. Uh, there were negotiations and economic circumstances in the forestry industry also helped on that front. Uh, these efforts in combination largely kept forestry, further forestry, out of Grassy Narrows territory in that period from 2005 to 2015. And, and what I want to highlight here is that what Grassy Narrows did, and this wasn't due to any planning or input on my part, is it took advantage of all the different ways in which treaties can be advanced. I mean, lawyers tend to think about treaties as legal documents. Fundamentally, they are political documents as well as legal documents. They are public relations documents. And they can be, and, and protecting treaty rights can be advanced on many fronts. In the court case, what we did was we essentially did rate, fought out two fights. So one is, is we decided to try to limit the effect, the negative effects of the Mikasu decision. In the Mikasu decision, the court said, the taking up clauses in the numbered treaties or the occupied lands treaties and some of the earlier treaties effectively was an internal limit on treaty rights and that it was it actually consistent with the treaty for governments to take up the land to use it and to limit where treaty rights apply. Now in Treaty 3, the taking up power specifically references the government of Canada, which is not the case in Treaty 8. And so the simple pitch that we were making was that, look, the treaty was negotiated by the government of Canada, it was primarily the responsibility of the government of Canada, and the treaty rights promised in the uh, treaty were assured to the First Nations by the government of Canada. All governments had to respect it, but only the government of Canada could limit those rights. And that's exactly what the treaty says. And so that even though over time the land became part of Ontario, the treaty itself was never rewritten to allow the government of Ontario to take away rights in the course of, of, of taking up land. The second part of the argument that was then advanced was that under our division of powers, that is the, the split between the federal government and the provincial government of legislative and executive power, only the federal government has the power to infringe treaty rights. And so reading those two things together, essentially, while the province of Ontario could grant rights to law, could grant rights to land, once those, rights, once those grants cross the line into significantly interfering with the rights, at that point, the government of Ontario was out of bounds and just 
could not resort to the, the justification analysis to uh, say, well, we have to do this in the public interest. And, and, and so this was designed to breathe life both, this litigation strategy was designed to breathe life both into the federal provincial relationship embedded in the treaty, but also to breathe life into this odd section in our Constitution, section 9124, which speaks to Indians and lands reserved for the Indians and gives the power over that topic to the federal government, which Hogg, Professor Hogg at, at Osgood had said, reflected the idea that the way in which our original constitution protected Aboriginal people was to essentially put the take the power over their affairs out of the local governments who had an interest in developing lands and put it into the hands of the more distant national government. Uh, and this, this was consistent with other parts of the Constitution. So we, we started a case, a judicial review, to challenge the forestry authorizations on this basis. Uh, the court said that it was too complex to be dealt with at a summary matter, turn it into a trial. We got an advanced cost order, fortunately, because the, the, the case cost close to, um, uh, close to a million and a half dollars to fight out, which fortunately was mostly paid for by the governments. Um, and we then took it to trial. At trial, we were successful across the board, and essentially Justice Sanderson accepted the view that we put forward that historically that to the Aboriginal people, yes, they understood, or to the Ojibwe who negotiated the treaty, they understood the crown as being the signatory, but they knew also that there were local governments and that there were they had different ranks of governments and that they were going to be dealing with the federal government. And they expected the government in Ottawa, which was the phrase that was used, to be the government that would maintain and protect their treaty rights. That, and uh, Justice Sanderson also largely on the basis of a, of a relatively recent Supreme Court of Canada case called Morris, uh, accepted our argument that, um, that, that the provinces had no power to infringe treaty rights if they couldn't find that power in the treaty itself. The matter was appealed to the Ontario Court of Appeal um, the Ontario Court of Appeal in what was uh, in an eight-day appeal, which is their second longest appeal, or their longest appeal since the Lac and Corona case, um, essentially found that Justice Sanderson, um, I, I think they thought I hypnotized her or something like that, because they found that she basically um, departed from the historical truth. And, and what they really meant was they, she departed from the non-Aboriginal historical truth. And, and fundamentally, she held, look, the purpose and intent of the government in entering into the treaty was to open up the lands for settlement, and it didn't matter which level of government managed these things. In the end, as long as there's consultation, we're okay. Uh, the Supreme Court of Canada granted leave to appeal to um, Grassy Narrows, and the matter went up and was heard shortly after the Chilcotin case. And this is where I'll pause and turn back to Chilcotin. The Chilcotin case, of course, uh, is about um, land that's not subject to treaty. And the question there is, is what, do, what, did a, what does a First Nation that uh, has not entered into treaty hold? And what the court in that case held was that they rejected the notion that had been accepted by the BC Court of Appeal, that essentially Aboriginal title consisted of small, very localized spots of land, and instead said that First Nations could hold territorial interests, so they could hold swaths of land, if you wish. Not 100% of traditional territory, not little dots, but substantial swaths of land, and effectively awarded um, a piece of, uh, recognized a piece of land about the size of Prince Edward Island as being owned in something close to fee simple by the Chilcotin people. But effectively in Chilcotin, and this is where I believe these cases are really about judicial policy, the Supreme Court of Canada made a grand trade-off. It said this. It said, we are going to recognize that Aboriginal interests can be widespread and very significant. And that's, you know, they, they recognize what amounted to an outright ownership right in land and an outright ownership right in a large piece of crown land. I mean, we are talking about tens, if not hundreds of millions of dollars in the swing here. And, and, and you know, you've cut a large chunk of British Columbia largely out of the ownership of the crown. And everybody knows that that's not a unique situation. 
Second, they said, we are going to beef up, I think at least, we'll see how this plays out, the whole justification infringement process to give Section 35 greater strength in protecting Aboriginal and treaty rights, particularly Aboriginal title in that case. But, and as always, all magic comes with a price to quote uh, from that television show, the court said, well, but there's a price to this. And the price is that we essentially are going to abolish, and I don't think there's any way to read it other than this, one of the principal traditional protections that have been given to Aboriginal people, namely this concept of interjurisdictional immunity, saying that there was a zone of over Aboriginal rights to which the provinces cannot enter. That there's essentially, even if the feds, federal government doesn't actively protect an Aboriginal interest, what the Supreme Court of Canada said was, um, used to say, was, well, you know, there's a zone that the provinces can't go into. The, 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 the Supreme Court of Canada, consistent with a large body of other case law that they've been developing, said, we don't like this. We don't like the idea it creates vacuums. We don't like the idea it creates jurisdictional confusion. And I think what they're really saying underneath it all, but of course it's not judicially politic to say this, we don't want to give too much protection here because it might be upsetting. So they essentially abolished, for all intents and purposes, this doctrine of interjurisdiction, meaning this inherent protection that came with the division of powers. And, and when we were intervening, uh, I was intervening for another treaty group in the Chilcotin case, and uh, in, during the course of that, our intervention, which was not actually about the division of powers, just as Cromwell it took, my, took me to the Division of Powers discussion. We got into it um, quite intensely. And it, in the really in course of all of the interveners' applications after that, there was a great discussion of this whole Division of Powers message. And, and the debate was had. And um, while the, the Chicote decision had not come down by the time the Grassy Narrows case was argued about four months later, it was pretty clear where they were going. Because that argument, one of the, the first questions asked to me uh, after a, quite a long silence, which is unusual at the Supreme Court of Canada, was the Chief Justice asking, aren't there a lot of doctrines flying around here? And, and I've got to say, that's not a heartwarming experience uh, when you're arguing for a number of these documents. And fundamentally, what the Supreme Court of Canada found um, was that, um, that they were going to make a decision con consistent with what they said in Chilcotin. So first of all, they said, the treaty is with the crown, and that's at paragraph 35, and they say, look, um, the governments are responsible for keeping the treaty promises and implementing the treaties, but the promise is ultimately with the crown. And that's consistent, I think, with, with what a lot of Aboriginal people would say. Um, but the consequence of this is that they say the level of government that interferes with the treaty rights is largely irrelevant. Um, and they discuss this at paragraph 49. They say, look, the changes in legislative power, just like we said in Horseman, uh, which dealt with Treaty 8, I think someone was throw something that might be 6, but I'm pretty sure it was 8, um, with Horseman, um, is that it's really, it doesn't contradict the spirit of the treaty to move from the federal government to the provincial government. Um, they then said that, look, uh, because of that, then, the treaty interpretation approach taken by the trial judge was wrong, that fundamentally the obligation is to, one, whichever government is doing it, to consult, and two, is that while every taking up might not be an infringement, at some point, if enough taking up occurs, there will be an infringement of the treaty rights, and both the sparrow, the justification infringement analysis will be engaged, and potentially the, the Crown could be sued for that infringement. And then the other thing we see is that, as opposed to what was done in, in, in Mikasu, where the court backed very much away from the concept of fiduciary duties, spoke of this broad honor of the Crown power, the, Crown in this, the court in this case moved back towards and indicated a move back, as they did in Chilcotin, towards the concept of fiduciary duties applying in the context of the treaty relationship. And, and, and in my submission, what the court is signaling in this case is that uh, 
that ultimately what the duty to consult and the, 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 the justification infringement analysis and the fiduciary duty is about is in the treaty con context is a duty to implement the treaty, is a duty to understand and to implement the treaty. But in terms of the, the specific arguments that we were bringing, the court largely held we were just wrong in principle, that really levels of government are irrelevant, all governments are on the same footing vis-a-vis -vis Aboriginal and treaty rights, um, and that the fundamental protection given to Aboriginal people is the Section 35 protection, not the Division of Powers protection. To, to my mind, the net result of this is that now Section 9124 is simply a section that empowers the federal government to enact laws, which may incidentally affect the, the provinces, but it does not, unfortunately, and I, I personally think, and, but being, this, being as they're the Supreme Court of Canada and I'm not, my personal thoughts are wrong, um, I personally think that this was a rather unfortunate decision that, that relatively casually cast aside close to 50 years of case law um, that had, had given treaties um, a, a special protection based on the division of powers in Section 88 of the Indian Act. Um, so, where do we go from here? And I've now got about three minutes left, so it'll be a quick tour of where I think we go from here. So, the message I believe in Mikasu and in Grassy Narrows is now crystal clear. Um, the court has essentially abandoned the division of powers as a tool for protecting Aboriginal people, but has said your solutions lie in understanding the substance of the treaties better, of trying to implement the substance of those treaties through, um, uh, through the consultation and accommodation process, and um, ultimately by turning to Section 35, when Crown action has gone so far as to contradict in a significant way the, the promises made in the treaty. Um, so, in terms of lawyer work, and as I've said before, this is only a small part of what the implementation of treaties is about, uh, where do I see the major issues? First, what do the historic treaties in fact promise? What we know is that the courts have said in Mikasu and in Grassy Narrows and in Horsemith, well, it's not a complete seed release and surrender. That there is a fundamental expectation that the way of life would be maintained. That there would be a meaningful right to hunt left and somewhere before that, there is a level of development which is unacceptable uh, without the treaty relationship being revisited. So I do think there's going to have to be litigation that tries to flesh out what that means. What is a meaningful right to hunt? Is it, and, and this was the debate in the West Moberly case, is it, as uh, Chris Devlin described it, uh, the right to hunt something somewhere? Or does it mean the right to hunt, for example, in a landscape that has open spaces in it? in a landscape that allows for familial exercise of rights? Does it allow for, does it require that traditionally hunted species still be able to be hunted? Does it require that spiritual activities have to be able to be practiced in conjunction with harvesting activities? These are all questions that are yet wide open and unanswered. And here, I believe, has to be a very significant part of the focus. And we see cases like the Mikasu are advancing this in their fights against the oil sand, as is the Athabasca Chippewaian First Nation. In the regulatory context, the Beaver Lake Cree are also putting forward um, that same argument in the context of, a, of an action against the Alberta government of Canada. In that context, it's worth remembering that never once has cession or surrender been mentioned. And I'm about to be given the hook here, I think. Uh, second is who must deliver the services? For example, on education, does Canada, does Ontario have a delivered service or Manitoba? And how will the duty to consult really work in a way that allows us to truly be informed about what the treaties mean? Um, these are substantial and difficult issues, and my hope is, is that people will take these cases forward and try to give some more strength in the Section 35 context of treaties. But this is where the fight is now. It's in the consultation Section 35 framework uh, the Supreme Court of Canada sends a fairly clear message about the division of powers framework. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Robert.